Theros is a plane full of champions, brave warriors, brilliant thinkers, and cunning wayfarers. But on this world, such heroes aren't relegated to just myth and songs. Sometimes their deeds are so great that even the gods of Theros are impressed. No easy feat to be sure, but those who manage to wow a god can be lifted to divinity, serving as a champion in Nyx. They become demigods. Hello everyone and welcome back to the Ether Hub. I'm Sybin bringing you more Magic the Gathering lore. As we explore Theros Beyond Death, a lot of you have inquired about the new creature type introduced in this set, Demigods, asking specifically how they fit into the lore of Theros. We've already covered a few of these semi-divine characters in previous videos, and we'll provide links in the description below for those. But still, let's explore every demigod that shows up in Theros Beyond Death, and what they did in their mortal lives to elevate them to Nyx. First, let's quickly go over what demigods actually are. Now, this is something I dipped into with more detail in another video, but this is our main topic for today, so it's good to brush up. Demigods in Magic the Gathering are lesser deities, those imbued with godly powers, but to a reduced degree. On other planes, these would include spirits like the Kami, aspects of nature but without the vast powers of true gods like the greater Kami on Kamigawa, or even the spirit avatars found on Shadowmoor, the dark side of Lorwyn. They represent abstract concepts, much like the gods on Theros do, but have only a percent of their power, making them demigods. Demigods on Theros are a unique phenomenon because they're not spirits, but mortals who are lifted to divine status by a god. Living or dead, the gods on Theros can find a worthy champion to bring to Nyx to serve as their champion, their right hand on the mortal plane. Right now in Theros Beyond Death, the demigods are being used in a war between the gods themselves, serving their master's will in a plane-wide conflict for superiority and devotion, the power source for all the gods on Theros. This means it's really up to the discretion of the god deciding who will become their champion, so long as their soul lingers on the mortal plane or in the underworld of Theros, and assuming their deeds are worthy enough, they can become a demigod. The first of the demigods we'll discuss is Daxos, blessed by the sun. Titled as such for being the champion of Heliod, the god of the sun. Heliod is the self-proclaimed greatest god in the pantheon, and he is great if you consider arrogance a mark of greatness. Heliod is the reason for and the aggressor in the war between the gods of Nyx. He demands that all give him devotion, mortal and god alike, and in his mission, Heliod has sent servants to smash the idols and poluses of other gods, cutting off his enemy's devotion, and making him public enemy number one in Nyx. And one of his willing servants is his greatest champion, the demigod Daxos. Now, I've gone into great detail of Daxos and how he became the demigod of Heliod in the video What's Happening with Daxos Blessed by the Sun, which you can watch by clicking the drop down that just appeared on the video or the link in the description below. In short, Daxos was the lost love of the planeswalker and hero of Theros and beyond death, Elspeth Tyrell. In his long, tragic tale, Daxos was loved, then died, and then found himself in the underworld. His love was so strong that he ventured beyond the underworld and became a returned, basically the zombies of Theros, in search of Elspeth in the mortal plane. Yet as he wandered Theros without memory, a side effect of being a returned, his redemption came to him like the rising sun. The gods were collecting champions to fight their war for them, and Heliod saw greatness in Daxos, despite his current state. Daxos in life was a great warrior and hero of his home, Miletus, a brilliant tactician with sword skills unmatched in his time. Heliod shined his glory on Daxos the Returned, and he became blessed by the sun. Aesthetically, Daxos became a completed badass, removing his golden mask, the mark of the return meant to represent the individual losing their true self, and using it as a new shield. He's also gifted a new broadsword made of Nyx itself by Heliod. Yet, there was something malicious behind his choice in Daxos. With Beyond Death exploring the journey of Elspeth's escape from the underworld and vengeance against Heliod for the god's betrayal, Heliod selected Daxos as a demigod to strike a psychological blow against his enemy. 
Daxos, as his demigod, was bound to Heliod's command, meaning Elspeth would at some point have to fight her love to get the vengeance she so desperately wanted. A conflict and plot point we actually never see played out in the story of Theros Beyond Death. A huge missed opportunity, to be sure. As war has two sides, the war between the gods on Theros have Heliod versus the god of the forge, Perforos, the first god to stand up against Heliod's aggression. And as Heliod has chosen Daxos for his demigod, Perforos has selected the great warrior king Annex, former ruler of Akros, now hardened by the forge. This is another character I went into more depth with in a dedicated video, which you can again find by clicking the annotation on the screen or linked in the description below. In short, Annex was once the great warrior king of Akros, the most militaristic city-state in all of Theros. Annex was once devoted to the god of victory, Aroes, but switched over to Perforos in order to extend the cultural and industrial influence of Akros. In doing so, Perforos was infused with new sources of devotion, which put Annex in good favor with the god of the forge. However, things would change for Annex when a band of minotaurs assaulted his city. A skilled warrior without fear, Annex took to the field of battle but was badly injured. Worse still, his beloved wife and queen, Siamede, was missing after the battle was won. Brutally injured and without his wife, Annex accepts his fate as the demigod of Perforos, fighting endless battles with the hopes of finding his beloved Siamede once again in the godly realm of Nyx. And no, I have no idea why this card summons Satyr tokens. Akros is a city-state defined by its order and discipline in battle. Satyrs are defined by their, well, chaotic natures and carefree lifestyles. Maybe Perforos is the new patron god of the satyrs since the god of revels, Xenagos, died in the original block? Perforos is the god of creativity, and the satyr, along with humans, are likely the most creative races on Theros. Honestly though, that's all I can really come up with. It's a weird ability for a character like Annex to have. Out of all the demigods in Theros Beyond Death, none are more feared than Timuret, once known as the Murder King, now seen as the Chosen from Death. Timuret, as his various titles suggest, is the demigod of Erebos, the god of the dead and keeper of the souls in the underworld. Erebos plays a pivotal role in the war between the gods, and he and Heliod are bitter rivals. The story and myth goes that Heliod was born upon the first rising of the sun as the light touched Theros, but as the first light glowed, it too cast the very first shadow, out of which Erebos was born. Heliod was frightened by this darkness, and thus the sun banished him to the darkest depths of Theros, the underworld. So these two gods are closely tied to one another, and Erebos would relish in toppling Heliod's hubris. His demigod, Timuret, would be crucial in accomplishing that goal. We know little of Timuret's life as a mortal on Theros, only that we now see him as a returned, again the zombies of Theros. The returned are souls who escape the underworld and wear golden masks, because in exchange for their freedom, they must first give up their memories and everything that made them unique individuals. This also was the case for Timuret, yet as we see on the card Grim Physician, the return can sometimes function and perform duties they once did in life, a small glimpse into who the returned once was. Judging from his actions, we can make a prediction that Timuret was once a powerful and bloodthirsty warlord on Theros, a leader of brutal raids and merciless slaughter, probably the reason behind Erebos selecting Timuret as his demigod. Timuret, even as a returned, is just really, really good at killing people. Erebus selecting Temurat a returned for his champion is actually a little surprising as Erebus doesn't have as good of a relationship with the returned as you would expect. Erebus is the Jailer of the Dead. The Returned are those who actually escaped their fates in the Underworld, and by extension, escaped Erebus. The God of the Dead simply doesn't like the Zombies of Theros. The Returned actually give their favor to the God of Deceit, Phanex, who was in fact the original Returned and progenitor of this race. Phanex was once a mortal in the Underworld, but through cunning and trickery, managed to be the first to escape the Grasps of Death a feat which elevated him to a god. Those who now follow the path of Phanex become the Returned, and Phanex is even responsible for founding the cities and polises of the Returned on Theros. They are in a sense Phanex's babies, not Erebos's. 
So that leads me to believe that Temrett must have done some great or terrible things in life rather than his time as a return to earn the favor of Erebos, because honestly, he should be the demigod of Fanex. The Returned have what I'll call a pseudo-culture. While many simply wander the plain in solitary grief, others have banded together to form cities and polises of their own. Famous ones would include Asphodel, home of the Grey Merchants, and Odunos. Timurit is the de facto leader of Odunos, the most warlike polis of the Return. He leads brutal raids on the cities of the living and commands the best warriors ever to don the Golden Mask of the Returned. Now as the Chosen from Death, Timurit is a demigod on the warpath for Erebos, calling the dead to fight for his god. One of the least known demigods in Theros Beyond Death would be the champion of Nalia, god of the hunt, who happens to be one of the least represented main gods in the Beyond Death set. Nylia has chosen the famous hunter of the wilds of Setessa, the polis of Nylia named Renata, now known as Call to the Hunt. Nylia is the god of the wilds on Theros, patron god of monstrous beasts, forests, valorous hunts, and those who respect the natural world. As such, her demigod is famed for her skill with a bow, hunting some of the most dangerous game in the Satessa wilds both for sport and to pay homage to her god. Again, we don't have much history on this character of Theros' lore, only scraps from a Satessan historian named Luthia, who recants some of Renata's adventures and run-ins with the various species and races of Theros. These would include an observation of the satyr as quoted on the card Careless Celebrant. Quote, Renata was mesmerized by the satyr's dance of gleeful indifference, of reckless grace, and bright disaster. End quote and a run-in with a minotaur blessed by his god Mogus, the god of slaughter, as seen on the card Infuriate. Quote, Renata launched a dozen arrows into the minotaur's thick hide, but the monster didn't slow its charge. The fury of Mogus was upon it. End quote. As a legendary warrior, marksman, and hunter, it was said Renata could hit a boar with a spear from over half a mile away, and that was probably the individual feat which enticed Nylia to select Renata as her demigod. As quoted on the card Nessian Boar, quote, Renata led the best hunters in all of Theros on a quest to bring down the terror of the Satessan wilds, end quote. As that mission was successful, Renata's status as a legendary hunter was secured and she became the Call to the Hunt. Another strange character to enter the realms of Nyx as a demigod is a fun-loving adventurer who has gone on to earn the respect of Thassa, god of the sea, for both her cunning and perseverance. This is the long tale of Calafi the Mariner, who went on to become beloved by the sea. Calafi is a unique case in Theros Beyond Death because while we don't know a lot about her life, we do have loads of evidence regarding her adventures as a captain and seafaring enthusiast. As she traveled throughout the oceans of Theros, Calafi had charts, maps, and observations of the creatures that inhabited the realm of Thassa, all while paying respect and providing offerings to the god of the unexplored. Even before Calafi appeared in Theros Beyond Death, her tales of run-ins with various sea monsters were noted in sets like Battle Bond and Conspiracy, on the cards Cloaked Siren and Benthic Giant, but her greatest work as a practitioner of the seas would come as a story written about her greatest adventure, a mythical tale known as the Calafeia. In Beyond Death, the arc of this epic is marked across six different cards, tracking her journey, struggles, and vindication all throughout. The Calafeia is a detailed account of Calafe's journey after the end of the Akroan War. As a captain in wartime, Calafe was swift and decisive, using her unmatched knowledge in seafaring to lead her sailors to victory, a victory in which Calafe and her men didn't properly give thanks to Thassafor, the god of the domain in which she has so mastered. If this sounds familiar, then you're right. The tale of Calafi mirrors that of Odysseus, written as an epic poem by Homer in the Odyssey. It's even similar down to the name, Odysseus and his Odyssey, Calafe and her Calafeia. So keep that in mind as we discuss how Calafe became the demigod of Thassa. As Calafe sailed home to return victorious, her men didn't properly pay tribute to Thassa and the god of the sea was angered. Vicious winds and unnatural currents blew the mariner off course and thus began her long track home, with a god bent on seeing them drown lurking just below the surface. 
first things didn't look so bad, washing up on a beautiful golden shore with generous centaur hosts, as seen on the card Nick's Born Courser. Quote, Storms drove them westward. To Cathophos, white plains shimmered in starlight. Centaurs greeted them, offering them gold-hued apples and grain cakes. But things were about to fall apart as they returned to their ships to head back on course, as seen in Nick's Born Brute. Quote, One-eyed and frightful, the Cyclops lifted a boulder and hurled it seaward from cliff's edge, shattering masts and scattering sailors. End quote. Still, Thassa had not lost complete hope in this brave and cunning mariner, and before drowning, manages to bless Calife with the gift of life as seen on Nick's born Sea Guard. Quote, Storm tossed and broken, Calife cried out to deep dwelling Thassa. Tritons came swiftly to save her, bringing her north to the Lindus. End quote. But rescue does not mean redemption, and the trials of Calife would continue in the car Nick's born Marauder. Quote, Calife guided them into darkness of Hatos, the Black Mire. Blood-horned Minotaurs circled them, axes a glimmer in shadow. End quote. Calife herself would grow with each new challenge presented to her, learning that not all obstacles can be muscled past, as seen on the car Nick's born Colossus. Quote, Three tall giants confronted her, fiercely demanding her pay tribute. Fox cunning Calife's slippery speaking entangled their senses. End quote. Escaping this, her final test, Thassa, god of the sea, opened up the mists that shrouded Calife's passage and brought her champion into a new world of unexplored majesty. It was the dream of this, the greatest navigator Theros has ever seen, to be the first of unknown shores. Quote, Calife gazed on the coastline, certain her destiny called her here, where the mist-shrouded rocks sang, promising glories undreamed of. End quote. This epic tale of overcoming the odds, unlike the end of Homer's The Odyssey, ends with Thassa praising the success of Calife, earning the mariner the blessing of the god, making her beloved of the sea. These five characters make up the demigods of Theros Beyond Death, living legends and heroes of myth that have done such great things as to lift them to divinity. Still, something is missing. This is a war between all gods, and the pantheon is far more vast than these five monocolored gods. The rest of the gods in Nyx have taken sides and should choose champions of their own. Perhaps demigods will see in future supplemental sets, for Commander as an example. If so, who do you think could be the demigods for the other gods of Theros? Who would make good servants for Mogus, Krufix, Karametra, and the others? Leave your thoughts on who they could be and what their cards would do in the comment section below, and I'll turn them into a video, giving you credits. Anyway guys, that's gonna do it for today's video. If you enjoyed it, make sure you support the channel by leaving it a like, subscribing to the channel, and ticking the notification bell so you never miss out on a new release. As always friends, thank you all so much for watching, and until next time, see ya!